So this theme was requested, and uh, I guess it was an interesting reflection for me to sort of uh, put the teachings into the context of the inner tyrant and, you know, just the sort of havoc that can create in the mind, and uh, to see where that sits in the Buddhist texts and also with uh, the idea of compassion. Because I think compassion is, you know, in the teachings of the Buddha, one of the motivations for his own spiritual search. So he said, you know, with a recollection that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain, he sought out a path. And also it was the outcome of that path. You know, the Buddha, as his wisdom developed, so the compassion. And he was known as the great compassionate one. And it was also his motivation to teach. So he taught out of Anukampa, which is the name of our project, for the benefit and welfare of all beings. So this is a very beautiful motivation that underlies the whole path. And I think the difference between compassion and metta is very subtle, but compassion is the way that love meets suffering. So it meets it with a very kind, warm spaciousness. You know, and it gives us the capacity to hold suffering. <clears throat> there have been some studies that show that um, compassionate behavior training actually makes the mind um, more resilient in the face of other people's suffering. And also, it is more likely to lead to altruistic behavior towards others than plain old mindfulness. You know, nothing against mindfulness, but I think you know, being able to infuse that mindfulness with compassion just gives it extra power. So it's not a weak thing, you know, just for sort of, you know, I don't know, namby-pamby nuns or... (laughs) It's actually something that increases our resilience and is very much informed by the Four Noble Truths. So it gives them meaning and richness and fullness. You know, because the whole teaching is that there is suffering and there's also a way out. But how we meet that suffering is very much informed by, you know, the qualities we develop in our heart. And through compassion, it gives us a, a way to meet it which is receptive, which listens in deeply and holds things gently. And I think another quality of compassion is respect, respecting our experience rather than fighting with it and arguing with reality. You know, so it opens our heart to embrace whatever arises and to embrace others too. So compassion and the Brahma Viharas in general are always framed in terms of de- being developed towards ourselves and others or towards others as to ourselves. So it's always something which is inclusive and not separate. And I think this um, is sometimes quite difficult in the West because we tend to have, and I guess for most people, but certainly you know, in a society that very much encourages competition and sort of self-criticism as a kind of way of improving ourselves and achieving a lot in life, it's somehow sometimes difficult to develop self-compassion which is free from judgment. And uh, someone called Kirsten, or Kristen Neff, did a lot of studies on this, and she found three main elements to self-compassion. One of them was uh, the aspect of kindness as opposed to judgment. And I think, for me, compassion and judgment are almost opposites, because when we're judging something, we're not able to understand it. We actually sometimes feel that it could be different or should be different. And it's the opposite of seeing that this is actually conditioned. you know. And in that conditioning, there may be pain, it may be painful conditioning that we're not actually able to just change overnight, you know. Whereas kindness is a sense, it carries a sense of understanding a situation and an empathetic resonance. This being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand where they're coming from. And so, yeah, and, and compassion is also one of the right motivations for practice. So sometimes people don't realize that this is actually in the Eightfold Path. You know, it starts off with right view, which is, again, an understanding that as I suffer, so do others. And there are causes for suffering, and there's also a way out. And in a sense, we're all conditioned. So there's no self which is kind of intractable and permanent and, you know, going to be there forever. We're a product of our background, our society, our culture, the messages that we've internalized from our parents and school systems. And so in the second factor of the Noble Path, the Buddha talks about meeting our experience with a sense of letting go. So letting go implies sort of non-owning our experience, realizing that this is an aspect of nature, it arises and it passes, and there's no use in grasping onto things. And then also the kindness, the metta, being able to perceive with loving eyes rather than critical eyes. And then the last one is non-harming, 
So you can also translate that as compassion or gentleness. Um, and I think that carries with it an aspect of patience too, because to be gentle, we have to give things time to unfold and to manifest. So with ourselves, you know, we need to give ourselves time to discover our full potential. You know, whether it's through studies or self-development or whatever it is, it takes time, and it, it's a matter of putting in the causes. You know, we can't hurry the results. There's this story in the, I think that Adrian Brown talks about where. Um, there was a little boy and he planted some saplings and his father said, oh, just keep watering and, them, and they'll sprout in some time, you know, after some time. So he went back every day to have a look if they were sprouting and eventually after like a few weeks they had little shoots on and he was just like, daddy, daddy, there's some shoots on the little plants. And, and at that point he just kind of lost patience and the next day he went back again and saw, oh, they're still not grown, you know, come on, come on. And after another week or so, he started to stretch them to try to <laughs> make them grow faster. And of course, he destroyed the lot. So that was the end of the little saplings. And I think this can happen in our spiritual practice too. And I think it's important to come to the practice from our, the right intention of compassion and patience and giving things time to unfold, um, rather than the opposite, which is a sort of ill will. You know, so when there is a lack of self-compassion, that gives the chance for these voices which are termed by some sort of uh, psychological uh, model as the inner tyrant or the inner critic. You know, often this is a lack of self-compassion. And we all have times when we feel more compassionate than others. One of them is when we're tired, you know, we don't feel particularly compassionate. We tend to get irritable and grumpy and see all the faults in ourselves and others. You know, maybe when we're stressed. So, you know, at times compassion is stronger than at other times. And you may notice that at certain times the inner critic, the sort of destructive, habitual voices which try to tell you you're not good enough or you're not clever enough, articulate enough, you don't really deserve to be where you are in life even though you've worked really, really hard for it. You know, all these things which try to undermine us and make us feel less than or, you know, almost imagine that there's some sort of perfected ideal of myself that I'm still not attaining. You know, our expectations are so incredibly high. And these voices can be very pervasive and, and undermining. So, in a sense, there's a model that says that this inner critic manifests in a way to protect us and to try to get the best out of us. But I think in education systems, we all know by now that criticism and sort of, you know, constantly goading somebody to do better isn't the best way to get more out of a person. The best way is to give encouragement and to give space and time for that person to grow. You know, but these inner critics, they sort of manifest as things which are trying to help us, but very often they're, they're quite harsh and stern. You know, it can manifest even in meditation. Like they break it down into about seven types, just as an example. And the first one I relate to quite strongly, which is the perfectionist. So, you know, this very high expectation of yourself to always do your absolute best in every, any given situation and not to make a single mistake. And of course, that's setting yourself up for failure, right? Because the expectation is just so high. And so even in meditation, this can come in like, you know, you need to be mindful, like really mindful all the time. And then the opposite of that is, I won't be able to do it. You know, it's too difficult. And there's so much stress around that. You know, I had it going through my university um, because I was used to getting really high grades. And um, in my first essay, I remember thinking, there's no way I can do this. You know, everybody on this degree is far more intelligent. They've already got loads of qualifications. There's no way I'm going to do it. And this voice caused me so much pain and stress that when I did get my grade and I saw it was a really high grade, I just said, no, that can't be mine, you know, that's not mine. And then I was so shocked by it that, uh, I don't know, it wasn't even a happy thing because then it set up a precedent that next time I'd have to do the same. <laughs> So, you know, even though this critic appears to be on our side, it's often not, and it, it just undermines our energy. Whereas the energy that you get from metta and, and compassion is a very joyful, uplifting energy, and it connects us to others. So this was the other aspect, one of the other aspects of self-compassion that Kristen Neff discovered. She said it's um, a feeling of um, shared humanity or common humanity as opposed to isolation. And I think this inner critical voice tends to be something that does isolate us. It kind of you know, makes us feel that we're somehow lacking compared to others. Whereas this sense of common humanity, you know, that we're all subject to aging and suffering and emotional pain 
all of us feel that we're in some way not good enough, whether that be in relationship or in society, you know. This is actually very common. It connects us. You know, it makes us able to be in relationship because there's something there that's different and unique and yet shared. And I think one of the ways that um, I learned this, I guess, at, at a fairly profound level for me was when I started my path and I was doing a lot of retreats. And I guess there was some sort of motiv- there was a good motivation to come out of suffering and to benefit others, but there was also a sense that I'll improve myself with this, you know. And so I had to be really careful because as soon as you want to improve, you're looking at things to improve. And the mind it can really latch on to the bits that aren't yet perfect. And, you know, that's what's called a kind of fault-finding mind, and it just becomes very narrow. It doesn't see the big picture. It just sees that one little piece that's still not the way I'd like it to be. And so whenever I was getting into this in my practice and thinking, am I improving, how am I doing, I'd think, okay, it's time to serve a retreat. And so I'd always intersperse my sitting retreats with serving. And it was just so wonderful, because I was in Asia at the time, and people would come to those retreats from absolutely every background, whether it be different castes in India or different uh, ethnic groups in Nepal. You know, some people illiterate, some people had to borrow money for their train fare, other people highly educated, you know people from all over the world, like foreigners, so-called foreigners, like lots of hippie travellers. And everybody in those ten days would go through very similar emotional states. And I started realising this is so universal, you know, and there's only a certain spectrum, really, of how low you can go, the despair and the anguish, to, you know, to the happiness that the human mind's capable of. And it's, it's the same for us all. You know, we're not even at different stages. We're just experiencing different things at different times. So how can we measure? You know, and these com- the, the practice of compassion and uh, metta and uh, also sympathetic joy and equanimity are called the divine abidings, the Brahma Viharas. And another word for that is apamana states. And that literally means no measuring. So measureless states. You know, abundant, exalted, immeasurable. Yeah. And it's really beautiful to um, contemplate that, you know, that we don't need to measure ourselves and judge ourselves. Yeah. So in the suttas, I, I, there's a lot to say about this, and I've been thinking about it today quite a bit, but I did want to bring in um, the suttas because the Buddha talks about thinking as something that we do have some ability to modify. Right? Because I think a lot of the problem with the so-called inner tyrant is that we see it as something fixed. And we're sort of entrenched in these habit patterns which seem quite intractable and difficult to change. But sometimes just becoming aware of them is already a start because as soon as we notice they're not for our benefit, they actually lead to harm, they lead to sapping away our energy, you know, deprecating our achievements or our self, sense of self. It's not really worth keeping, you know. And um, even the Buddha struggled with these things before his enlightenment. So there's a very nice sutta called the Dweda Vitaka Sutta, and it's about two kinds of thought. And the first kind of thought, he said, he, he recognized that there were these two kinds, right? So in a way, the first step with working with the inner critic is to see what's going on and to bring it into conscious awareness. So you recognize that there's different voices in the mind. And he said, on the one side, he put these... Uh, thoughts which were motivated by compassion, by loving kindness and by letting go or renunciation and on the other side he categorised the unwholesome thoughts as the ones that are based on the opposites, so the thoughts that are motivated by aversion by sense desire rather than letting go and by uh, thoughts of harm thoughts of harm, so I think the inner critic falls into that category, it's certainly quite aversive a lot of the time and it's also fairly harmful So the first thing was to recognize this and to become conscious. And in that sutta, the Buddha said that was enough for him to be able to put down the negative thinking. Probably there was a long process there because nothing happens overnight. But it's a start. And then I think the next thing is to see, like, where are these things coming from? You know, are they really coming from me as a person or are they coming from my conditioned background? Because if so, and it's always actually the case, we can you know, put different conditions in place so that we get different effects. So to notice what kind of motivation lies behind the thinking is very helpful in understanding whether they are for your benefit or not. And uh, one thing I read about today is uh, something called voice training, I think. 
and um, they talk about a method of um, so you have to identify the thoughts so something like oh I'm never going to be good enough you know I'm never quite up to scratch and nobody really cares about me and you change that around to say oh you're never really up to scratch you're never going to be good enough nobody really cares about you and the purpose of putting it in the second person is to identify how hostile how, what a lot of hostility is actually there because sometimes I think we've become so used to talking our, to ourselves in a certain way that we really believe those messages. We've really started to internalize them. So they become, in a way, second nature. Sometimes they're not even manifest as thoughts. They're just kind of nagging sense of something not being quite right that we carry through our lives. You know, and that sort of seems to push us on to always wanting to improve. And we don't recognize that this is actually coming from quite a negative source. So by turning it around in that way, it's easier to see that you wouldn't speak to anyone else like that. You know, we speak to ourselves in ways no one else can see, and if they could see, they'd probably be quite shocked, and we'd probably modify our language quite, quite uh, closely, you know, quite a lot, before speaking to somebody else in those sort of terms. So I think that's quite a, a helpful thing, just to get a sense of where these things are coming from, and to see that they're not actually bringing out the best in you, right? And then the other thing is to see, like, where is this leading you? Like, where is that kind of thinking actually going? Is it going in the direction of benefit or harm? And the Buddha said that it was very obvious to see that the compassionate thoughts, the thoughts of non-harming, kindness, letting go, renunciation, were for his benefit and were aids to wisdom. So I really like this, as aids to wisdom. Because sometimes we think, oh yeah, but that good thought or that kind thought isn't really true. But is any thought really true? You know? What makes one thought truer than another? They're all conditioned at this stage, right? We, we don't have right view fully. We're not fountains of wisdom and full of compassion at all times. So which thought is right? I think rather than looking at it in terms of good or bad or even beneficial or unbeneficial, it's like what is leading to, well, I suppose that's beneficial, what is leading to my benefit and leading to wisdom? So in a sense, anything that undermines these five hindrances in the mind, so desire, aversion, doubt, sloth and torpor, yeah? what's the other one, restlessness, anything that undermines these is helpful in helping us to get closer to what's really going on, to truth. Yeah? So if this is an aid to wisdom, then it's worth cultivating right intention and, and thoughts of kindness. And so when we see you know, where these are coming from and where they're leading, quite clearly, this can be enough to start to change the pattern. But there are also other um, methods that the Buddha talks about in the suttas. And I think with all of these, again, it's important to get the right motivation towards the practice and not to hang on to these methods as a way to kind of push the inner critic out or like say, hey, you know, I'm sick of you, get out of here, you don't belong because that can be just another inner critic trying to drive out your other inner critic, <laughs> and the whole thing becomes like a negative feedback system, you know, where there's all these different parts of you in conflict and struggling against each other. So rather than that, there's a way to befriend the inner tyrant. And uh, I mean, even by labeling it inner tyrant, I think the way that that can be useful is that it's a kind of anthropomorphizing of this phenomena. Like, it's not actually a thing, it's not actually a part of you as a permanent entity. But by anthropomorphizing, you may be able to see it with a bit more tenderness. Like, okay, it's just this little being, you know, that's perhaps a little bit sad or neglected or actually has something to say, but is just not saying it very skillfully. Right? So you anthropomorphize it as an inner tyrant. But, uh, yeah, then the way to work with that inner tyrant is rather than sort of say, okay, get out of here, which is a version, is to actually befriend it and to say, okay, is there something there that needs to be heard? You know? Like compassion says, okay, this is painful, or this is difficult, or this is grief arising, this is despair arising. How can I comfort myself? I think this is a really good sort of um, description of compassion in action, in a sense. It's that attitude that wants to give comfort, yeah? and that wants to soothe down the system, like speak kindly, speak softly, and soothe the hurt and the pain. So if we approach the inner critic in that way, I think it's much healthier, and it also enables us to stay with it long enough to actually understand what's going on.
So with that kind of motivation, you know, that we want to befriend it, I think we can pick up these methods according to time and place. So this comes from the, another sutta called Vitaka Santana Sutta, which is uh, five ways of overcoming thought. And it's interesting in this one because it doesn't say overcoming negative thought, even though they've translated it that way. It actually only says overcoming thought. Right? So this is talking about a process into deepening samadhi and stillness. So the first of these methods is uh, called substitution or replacement. And I think this is, this is interesting because it's actually saying that, yes, there are these unwholesome thoughts on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are thoughts of kindness. And we can actually learn to reframe one thing in another way. So cognitive behavioral therapy probably comes in this kind of paradigm. You know, I remember when I was a teenager, I went to a cognitive therapist for about three months. It wasn't very long. And it was, I remember it was a lot about feeling... Uh, that I'm not good enough, I won't be able to do things, like underconfidence. Under, it's like an undermining kind of inner voice. So I remember one of the examples I gave her was that I was worried I wouldn't be able to do the next project. And she said, well, did you do the previous one? I said, yes, I did it really well. And she said, well, instead of saying, oh, maybe I won't be able to do it, what about saying, maybe I'll do it and maybe it'll be good? Or maybe it'll be good enough, you know? And just shifting it in that way and seeing there was a possibility to change my thinking brought enormous relief. It was almost like the chip in the, the crack in the system, you know, where I could start to sort of doubt the validity of my thinking. So this was a kind of example of substitution. You know, we can do that in our daily life. You know, one of my inner voices at the moment is like, oh, there's so much work to do, you must work harder, you know, or... Yeah, there's not much time, like, work really hard, otherwise something's going to go wrong, or maybe even the guilt-tripping voice that says, oh, you should have done that, you didn't do it well enough, and now people won't benefit the way they could have done if you'd have given your talk a bit more consideration, you know. <laughs> so this is a really insidious, like, guilt-tripping voice. And sometimes when I see that you could work harder thing, I just stand back and, and, and say okay, there's a lot of work to do, so how about I encourage myself instead and say, oh, there is work to do, so how about you have a nice rest, then you can make a matcha latte in the kitchen, which always works, <laughs> and then, you know, just give it a couple of hours today and then, you know, see how far you get. And it's a lot more encouraging to approach it that way, and I find that I haven't wasted any time at all with the rest and with the matcha latte because I'm approaching it in a much gentler way and also accepting that maybe it won't be the best ever talk I've given, you know, but it will be good enough. And in the end, it's not really about that anyway, right? It's just about turning up as we are, with all our imperfections, and being human, and being relatable, you know? There's nothing more intimidating than a perfect person. It's really interesting with my teacher. I mean, a lot of people sort of see him and think, oh, is he really, like, enlightened? He looks a bit sort of all over the place, like he says a bit of strange jokes and really a bit naff. <laughs> Sometimes they're even a bit sexist, which I do t sort of take issue with. But then I also understand that he's lived his life in patriarchies. And, you know, he said to me once, it's just my conditioning. But he totally, uh, when he recognises that that's harmful, he, he turns it around immediately. I often give him a little look and he gives me one back and it's like, OK. Maybe that joke's not quite appropriate. <laughs> but, you know, one of the reasons he does this, and I know that might sound like an excuse, but I know it because it's how he's trained me since I met him, is to make himself approachable. When I met my teacher, I'd only ever heard his Reigns Retreat talks, which are really quite profound and deep, with no jokes at all, and really very beautiful, actually, but slightly um, confronting, because, you know, there's a lot to confront. We have a lot of delusion, we have a very entrenched sense of self, and this is causing suffering, you know? And someone who's seen through the sense of self understands that, you know, that needs to be challenged, and it's quite scary. It's quite a scary process. So these talks were really quite powerful, and I didn't think of him as a joker or some, you know, I didn't know anything about him. So when I met him, I remember paying respects, and I was almost trembling, you know, and he was just very kind. So like, okay, sit up. You know. <laughs> and he looked a bit floppy. He'd just come from the airport. He's raised for, I think actually, mine's getting like that too, falling off, you know. And... Um, and, yeah, he was just very kind and soft. He didn't try to change me. But then over the times that I met him, I noticed he started trying to joke around with me, and I was a bit resistant at first. 
But after a while, I realised that it was enabling me to ask questions that I would have otherwise felt a bit intimidated about asking. And by now, we can just laugh and joke like brother and sister, and it's so beautiful. And yet the, the respect is so incredibly deep because I know how he's manifesting the Dhamma. I see the Dhamma manifested in a deep way, and I also see the human being that I can relate to to access that Dhamma and to access that wisdom. And it doesn't judge you know, somebody who's developed so much compassion doesn't judge you. And so it's very beautiful to feel so at ease in another person's presence, you know. And I don't think he's ever used an inner tyrannical voice towards, I've certainly never heard him talk about himself that way, but even towards me, even when I've asked for negative feedback, mistakenly thinking that that will help me be better, he just hasn't given me any. First time I asked, he said, oh, you have to know that for yourself. And, uh, and even another time, I sort of tried to compare how I was feeling now with how I'd felt a couple of years previous. I said, I'm better now, aren't I, Ajahn? You know, like I'm doing quite well. Like I'm not as depressed, you know, because <laughs> I was going through quite a hard time. And he said, I don't know. I said, oh, come on, you know, like I went to you, I was crying and telling you I was like struggling in my journey. And yeah, I really don't know, he said. And I was kind of confused. And then he just added on, I don't judge. And at that point, I realized that although I wouldn't have thought, thought that was a judgment, had he said, oh, yeah, you're doing much better now, again, it would have like, fed into my inner kind of perfectionist, thinking, oh, if I'm doing well now, I've got to keep going, doing well, you know, and carry on doing well. And what will he think of me next time? He might think I've gone back again. So there was no way for that to be there at all. And just having that sort of mirror is so helpful to undermine this inner critic. Yeah. Anyway... That went off tangent a bit because I was talking about substitution. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes when you see in another person different ways of being, it can help us to pick up different conditioning. Because often you'll find that that inner voice is not really your voice at all. It's the voice of your father or it's the voice of the teacher or, you know, somebody else's voice entirely. It's not really yours. It doesn't belong to you. It's just what we've picked up. So another way of substitution, which I think is quite important to point out, is um, actually getting into the body and substituting the thinking for, getting, for the emotional tone of the voice. Yeah? What that kind of... Uh, whether the, the thought has then led to a sensation or whether there's been a certain kind of unrest at the physical level or the somatic level that's led to negative thinking. When you get back into the body, the inner tyrant doesn't really know what to do. And Ajahn Suchito says that it's um, an ideological construct that is basically terrified of feeling. It doesn't understand the realm of feeling because it lives in the realm of ideology, right? ideas about yourself. It's totally creative. So when you get into the body, you're much more in line with truth, what's actually happening at this moment, beyond concepts and words and judgments. Yeah. So I think this is another kind of substitution that's quite helpful. And I'll just run through the others quickly because I want to have some time for discussion. And I think that's the main piece. Um, and it's the first as well. Often in these sequences, the Buddha gives a kind of uh, order that, you know, you try this one. If this one doesn't work, try the next one. The next one is seeing the danger in those, th in those thoughts. So that relates to what we were saying before, that they lead to affliction. In the sort of, it says, of oneself and others. Affliction is a quite, quite a sort of archaic word, but anything that's not for one's benefit or that maybe could create conflict... Um, could be demeaning of oneself, could undermine one's like motivation or you know, lead to a sense of helplessness. Whatever it is that leads to more suffering, yeah, there's a danger in that. And one of the biggest dangers is that you're depriving yourself of the benefits of meditation. Yeah. It's an obstacle to wisdom. It stops the process. It blocks your path to nibbana. Right? So that's a pretty big danger. But not to freak us out, just to recognize that, you know, this isn't really helpful. And then the next one is actually ignoring those thoughts. And this is quite important. I'll just talk about that a little, a little bit. Because I think one of the tricky things with a subject like this is that we can start to, like, the inner critic can start to land on the inner critic and say, okay, this is something I've got to take home and start to work on, right? And then if you really keep bringing that up and make that your main practice, you may neglect to see all the beautiful qualities that you already have, you know, all the voices that are very kind and compassionate because you're looking for the inner critic and how to combat that. 
So I think the idea of ignoring is, is really important at times. And it doesn't mean that you, know, you forget about these critical voices or that you can't use skillful means to try and find different ways to speak to yourself more kindly and softly and more, in a more encouraging way. It just means that we don't always want to have it right in the front of our attention. Sometimes you might want to put like the kindness in the, front of the, in the middle of the screen, so to speak, if your awareness is like a screen. So you have the kindness, you have the compassion in the middle, and then the inner tyrant's there, but it's not a big problem. You, know, you can meet that with compassion. And over time, by developing this attitude of compassion, the inner tyrant actually starts to soften and almost disappear. It can't really exist, coexist with kindness it's not really possible yeah so so this is the ignoring and um, yeah I think that pertains to most of life just to make it sort of a bit more practical you know you can sort of see what's happening in the world sometimes and yesterday we had a discussion about this at home or at the Bihara about you know the state of Brexit and Donald Trump and all this right wing movement that seems to be happening globally and after a while of reflecting on that, I felt really depressed about being here, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's important to know which way things are moving, just in case there's anything we can do not to perpetuate that or even to sort of speak out about that, which is why I say it, and I don't mind saying it, because I think this isn't about politics, this is about, you know, behaviours that are leading to the harm or benefit of society. It's ethical, it's an ethical thing for me. Um, but, you know, to dwell on these things too much, just zaps your energy to the point where you're not able to do anything. First of all, you're not able to see what needs to be done, and even if you can, you're too exhausted to do it. So I think in general, you know, it's about starting to learn to see how our patterns are, are um, which direction they're leading us in. Yeah? And this is what the Buddha calls sense restraint. It doesn't mean like avoiding things in life, but it means learning to perceive, learning to think, learning to speak in ways that lead to an increase in the wholesome states and a decrease in the unwholesome states. Yeah. So this is the path, this is the practice, and uh, there's many, many ways we can do it, but I would like to open it up for some uh, feedback and some perhaps personal examples or um, questions about that and, uh, and just see what other people's experience is. So that's enough for me, so I'll open it up.